iVetX.com. iVetX, bridging the employer veteran gap by putting Americans veterans to work today. Hey, good morning. You're on the arms room with uh, John, and today we have a special co-host, a uh, new instructor with independent training by the name of Matt. Glenn is out of town this week doing some training up in Utah and will not be with us, so hopefully he'll get a chance to call in later. Um, oh, this weekend was fantastic. I took two days off from my family and went and did a uh, two-day handgun course, and uh, I still can't grip anything today. My hands are still sore. Um, <laughs> how was your weekend, Adam? <laughs> My weekend was good. It's, it's the last comment you made just kind of, that must be bad. You can't grip anything, huh? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Well, see there, you know what? Glenn's right. You do always take it that way, I don't you? I don't know what you're talking about. I just said it must be bad <laughs> that you can't grip anything. I'm just saying. All know? right, all right. I got you. You had to I drive here, right? I did. So I was thinking about your safety. I don't oh. know what you were thinking Well, about like, I loosely I grabbed my steering wheel, but... Like, I could not open a jar of jelly I'm just this saying, morning because my hands saying. are tired. You had jelly for breakfast. I had jelly for I <laughs> ate it by the spoonful, actually. <laughs> um, all right, so our new guy, this is going to be a new medical instructor with independence training by the name of Matt, and I your last name escapes me. But Dobson. It, like Dobson, Matt Dobson. All right, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself this morning, Matt. Well, um, did f just under five years in the Army. Uh, I was in the uh, 101st, did a little fun time in Afghanistan. And then after that, I went to Fort Sam, which is a party for those that do or don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> got to finish up my time <coughs> helping out, instructing, teaching uh, CLS classes and doing all sorts of stuff like sitting in an ambulance on the range. Oh, that's always fun. I've, I've unfortunately time. been stuck as the, uh, the CLS guy doing that. Yeah. It pretty much blows. Um, all right. So today's show we are talking about, if you're watching us live or if you're watching us on YouTube later, um, we're going to be talking about tactical gear, and I hate to use the word tactical because I hate that word. Um, every time it gets used, a kitten dies. So, But um, we're going to be talking about setting it up for yourself, um, mistakes that we see, and um, how to set up your gear for practical reasons. And, you know, we're also going to talk about my Facebook page, which no one is uh, no one is safe from being on. But um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, mistakes that we see a lot of times with uh, tactical gear specifically. One of the most common that we see um, is people inappropriately setting up a thigh rig for either their handgun or extra magazines. Now, the term thigh rig is a... Uh, let's go with a loose interpretation of where that thing should be worn. Um, drop leg is, is more appropriate because essentially the concept behind those was to get whatever it was on your belt, whether it was extra magazines, a handgun, a med kit, anything you wanted to wear is to get it down off of your belt line so that you could properly wear armor or a battle belt or anything else. And more often than not, the thigh rig turns into a modified ankle rig, as I'm sure you've You've probably seen more than yes. Yes, five or six thousand times, and if you don't wear those right, it, it really sucks. Um, another mistake that is often seen is on the top here, where there's there's pals webbing. Before we move on, we're going to talk about that. Um, Molly and pals are not interchangeable terms; they are not the same thing. Molly is the military's term for all of the load bearing equipment that is issued. It is modular lightweight load-bearing equipment. PALS, which is the webbing that is on this stuff and all over everything else that is tactical, is pouch attachment ladder system. A little bit of knowledge there. Not now everybody you know. knows that. Now you know, and knowing is half, half the battle. battle. So um, just, and that's, the, that's another real common mistake, is if there's webbing, it doesn't have to be covered. You don't have to have a pouch on every piece of webbing on your kit. So, um, <laughs> I love it. I love seeing that. Um, and then uh, the one of the more common ones is the, uh, the admin pouch that gets put right there above your uh, above your magazines. 
which prevents you from being able to effectively get your magazines out. So, what are some mistakes you've seen? I know you've seen some crazy stuff um, as a medic. I don't even know where to start. You got, um, honestly, the, the group of guys I was with were pretty on point and uh, knew what they were doing with their gear set up and everything. But I've seen a lot of pictures on the internet of you know guys <laughs> on SWAT callouts and they have a, uh, you know, pouches upon pouches. They got a giant roll of duct tape carabiner to their vest. Um, they have pouches immediately on top of their handgun. They're not oh, even able yeah. to draw it. They have a uh, what's another good one I've seen? Ghillie suits in parking lots. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, touch on that when we get to the practicality <laughs> of your equipment. Um, you know, just the, the group of guys I was with in the military, they, they knew what they were doing with the gear. You know, when I got sent to Fort Sam, that's another story. No, oh, yeah, um, Just people, that, they're not set up right. They don't know really where to start because, you know, um, they never had anybody show them the right way to do it. Right. And then they're just kind of going to go with it. Um you know, mags interrupted, thing, you know, the sequence is interrupted, so they have, you know, like you were pointing out before the show, pistol mag, flashlight, pistol mag, <laughs> Gerber, pistol yeah. mag, knife. Yeah, don't do not do that. I have, uh, myself and Glenn have both seen people try to shove not pistol magazines into the bottom of pistols for reloads, and it doesn't fit, nor does it, if you do get it in there, nor is it effective, so. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this not go in? What about you, Adam? You ever seen any craziness that we that we've missed here? No, I think you guys pretty much covered it. You know, it was like walking into Walmart and seeing the guy that's fully tacticaled out. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I actually saw that guy a few weeks the, ago. Then he's at the he's at the uh, at the counter getting his hunting license. Yep. You know, you're like, well. <clears throat> I actually saw that. I was in Walmart. I love Walmart, by the way. Um, several weeks ago now. And I'm walking around, and I walk back, and I always go back to look at the ammo and sporting goods. Um, and there's this guy walking around in Walmart, a pair of ratty jeans, a horrible, horrible T-shirt, and a, like, full-on cop belt with handcuffs and flashlights and a pistol. And I was... Was it a high point? Uh, no, I think it may have actually been a Glock. Wow. Yeah, that, that really threw me for a loop. But, um, you know, if you're going to set your gear up and you're going to get into this type of thing, think about what you're doing and make sure that you're being practical. You know, another another common mistake is um, one of my favorites is people will put their, <clears throat> pardon me, will put their pistol on the side of their plate carrier so that the butt of their pistol is in their armpit. And if you've ever tried to get a, pistol out of your armpit it doesn't really work very well so oh man oh man oh man now back to some of these mistakes if you really want to get a good laugh out of some of this stuff um, check out my Facebook page for my company Redwire Gear um, and we do a series called you know how I know of photo memes and basically I cruise around the internet looking for jacked up gear setups and I take their picture and I post them up and make fun of them. And um, this all got started when I first started working for Glenn several years ago now. We started this thing called, you know how I know you don't use your shit. And we would send these photos back and forth to one another. Plastic <coughs> camelback covers. Oh, yeah. One. Oh, yeah. Um, camelbacks with the plastic still on the nipple. You know, stuff all bright and shiny new. Oh, yeah, I just got my new vest. You know, I'm going to go out to the range. Um, one of my other ones, another one that I stumble across a lot is, uh, I think it's a leftover from military guys for like, um, it's like some guys in the military, especially the, the infantry will walk around and somebody will have a breaching shotgun. So somewhere on their vest, they will have an AR-15 magazine pouch. And on the front of that, there's usually some little elastic loops and they'll put some shotgun shells in there for breaching. Right. If you're not carrying a breaching shotgun, you don't need shotgun shells on your vest with your rifle. So let's let's leave our shotgun shells at home unless we're carrying a shotgun. So um, other mistakes, other mistakes. Let me think about this for a minute. I don't think there's really any... using the cheapest stuff you can find. Oh yeah, yeah. That that's a big one. Um, thank you. I did not write that down. I should have. 
Um, when it comes to your gear, don't be afraid to spend the extra money. Um, there's nothing wrong if, you know, buy the best you can afford. If the best you can afford is a Condor or a Voodoo Tactical, so be it, you it'll, know. It'll do the job. It'll get Most the job likely. done. Most likely. Um, but you're never going to be sad with spending money on better equipment. Now, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy London Bridge or Cry, because even though those are all fantastic pieces of equipment, they are not inexpensive. So The thing with the high-end gear is it's going to hold its value. Mm -hmm. um, you'll always be able to resell it for a pretty decent amount. Um, you buy Condor stuff, you buy replica stuff, fly stuff. It's going to hold its value to a point, um, but I, you get a TSS, like, for those watching the show, I got a TSSI M9 bag. It's basically a st streamlined medic bag. Um, these go for like 300 bucks new. When I was in the Army, they were still going for about 300 bucks new. You look on eBay, they're still going for a lot. Um, they hold their value. High quality stuff holds its value. Um, original cry, multi-cam stuff, still going for a decent amount. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's kind of a return you'll get if you do invest in the higher quality gear is it's going to hold its value because it's not going to break down because it's made with quality. And some of the Condor stuff I've seen, um, Condor's big problem has always been consistency. Same with any of the other lower end, uh, lower priced gear out there is consistency. It's, um, it's usually pretty good stuff. It's made out of the same materials, but it's generally farmed out in a factory with 10,000 screaming Chinamen, you know, running sewing machines. So their consistency lacks. The stitching is usually fair at best. <clears throat> and I've run Condor, like a lot of Condor, because I'm a broke guy, you know. Yeah. So, and the stuff I have is, you know, it's, it's run fine. It's done me well. Their magazine pouches are, you can't beat the price for Condor mag pouches. They're like 20 bucks for a triple shingle. So... Um, let's see. What else have you got up here? Oh, I see you. Okay, so you've got your backpack, your plate carrier. Yes. And a uh, little chest rig there. And this is, um, this is where we'll start to touch on the practicality of, uh, of your equipment. Um, there's a guy out there by the name of John Mosby. He runs a training organization, and uh, he does a blog every month called Mountain, I think it's Mountain Gorilla. And he put an article out not that long ago um, about this very subject and his tactical gear setup. And essentially, he lays it out and he's like, look, one of the first things he says is, look, he's like, I have a very different approach to how I set my gear up than somebody else does. And, you know, he's an old school SF guy. You know, he's all about the the end of the world and, you know, him and his buddies are going to have to be zombies. Well, and, and he's not necessarily, yeah, whatever your fantasy is, right. zombie, civil unrest, but uh, he takes a very um, very different approach as far as like the civil unrest concept goes as to, you know, if, I, if I'm if i in a situation like this, I'm going to need, you know, he basically still carries his full military loadout with slight modifications now, but he teaches patrolling classes and things like that, so for his concept <clears throat> and his lifestyle... That's the way he's got his gear set up. He, I think he said he carries like 11 rifle magazines. And his justification for that is, is if I'm caught in an ambush and I'm doing a break contact, you know, I'm going to go through four, five, six magazines, mo rickety tick, just to get out of there. And I don't know what else is coming down the pipe. You know, it's just me. I don't have a resupply coming in 24, 48 hours, you know. So he has a very, uh, very nice approach and he's, I love reading this stuff, man, because he's so straightforward about it. Um, another thing that goes with tactical gear is um, physical fitness. Because if you've got this gear and you've never put it on and gone out it and... It gets heavy. Oh, my God, it gets heavy, dude. There's a picture on the internet. I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's a really, really heavy guy wearing a, like a full CRAS. Woodland camo. No, oh, yeah. I think it's an like airsoft. Don't be afraid. Things. I'm here. Yeah, I'm from yeah, the I'm internet, from and the I'm internet. here to help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was another line in, in Mosby's thing is something to the effect of if, you're, um, if your waistline or your belt line is the same as your chest line, there's no equipment that's going to make anything comfortable. 
Right. And that's a loose, loose paraphrase of his. But, um, oh my goodness, pardon me. I'm it's having quality. problems this morning. Jesus. So, um, let's talk about, let's talk a little bit more about the practicality here before we go on break. I have several different setups at home. You know, I've got a war belt. I've got, um, a tag banshee plate carrier, which for the money, you can't beat the quality. Um, I think they're like 150 bucks brand new, and you can generally pick one up somewhere cheaper for around 100 bucks. Um, and then I also have a U.S. Palm Molly Defender that I keep by my bedside, which if you've listened to our previous shows about um, armor, I think it was two or three weeks ago, you understand why I have that. Um, everybody should have some armor at home. Yeah, there you go. But um, and all three of those vests are set up differently because, or all three of those kits are set up differently because they're for different things. It's like my war belt. Um, I bought it before my last deployment because that's one thing that the military fails to cover is the very top of the femoral and the lower back for the most part. Um, so I bought an armored war belt to wear, and I found out once I got to deployment and got my vest, it didn't fit. Like I couldn't wear my belt with my vest, so. Oh, well, I now have a really nice armored war belt to wear that around. Happens. Yeah, but I've got it for um, very specific things. Like I only keep keep one or two rifle mags on it and a couple of pistol mags and a med kit. Basically a first line. Yeah, it's my, you know, it's my first line that I will occasionally, and sometimes I'll take just that out if I'm going out to do some, some transitional training with my carbine and my handgun. Because it's easy, I don't have to shove stuff in my pockets. You know, it's comfortable. It's not very cumbersome. Um, and then I have my my plate carrier, which is set up very differently than the one laying here in front of me. <laughs> I've got a uh, I've got one triple pistol or a uh, rifle mag shingle on the front of it, and that's that's pretty much it. Because I've got it for carving classes. You know, because that's you know it's it's difficult to to go and take a carving training class and wear like three rifle mags on my normal belt and then have two or three shoved in my pockets and so on and so forth. And it just gets to be cumbersome and irritating. So I bought that plate carrier and set it up just for that. It has hard armor in it, you know, and the way I live my life is if I need to use it for civil unrest, zombie apocalypse, so on and so forth, I don't intend to go anywhere. So I'm going to be near resupply, but three mags, four mags with one of my rifle is, you know, in my opinion, going to be enough for the things that I'm going to encounter. And then my other vest, my Molly or my uh, Defender vest that I keep by my bedside has a flashlight, a tourniquet, and a pistol mag on it because those are the things I'm going to need when I wake up at 2 a.m. in my chonies to go check that bump in the night in my house. So how about you there, man? And you've got to have more stuff than this at home. Yeah, I have a... I have a lot of goodies. Um, it, it all comes down to what, what's your needs. You know, um, if I'm going to go on a backpacking hunting trip, probably not going to wear a plate carrier with six mags, a dump pouch, uh, radios, you know, steel plates. Um, I'd probably wear something like this over here. Just a basic chest rig. You know, throw a couple mags on there, med kit, maybe a radio if you're going to be working with guys at different sites. Um, you know, keep it simple. A lot of people, they want to look like the SEALs. They want to look like the latest and greatest, you know, cool guys. And um, if that doesn't fit your purpose, you're just going to be spending a lot of money on gear that you don't really need. Um, and then I'm going to buy it from you later. At a lower... At a the, much lower price. It's still going to be an investment if it was, you know, quality stuff. But um, that's just money you could put towards ammo. Yeah, there you um, go. Or training. So there's... I mean, I got a. This is pretty much my main one. I'm yeah. still working on her, um, trying to figure out exactly how I want it set up, how it's going to incorporate with the Wait, first hold line. Wait, hold on a minute. You're you're actually putting thought into into how you're setting your gear up. It's crazy. Why? That's... Yeah. So I got out of the army and I was able to think for myself. No. So, that's crazy. I know. That, that's good stuff, man. And and I think we're gonna we're gonna delve into that a little bit deeper. I think we're getting ready to go on break here in about ten or fifteen seconds. So we'll uh. We'll get back to that when we come back. Listen to the arms room. Everyone's going to need an attorney at some point in their life. I'm no different. Hey, everyone, it's James from Vets On. Whether it was my last will and testament before deployment or my ongoing custody battle for my children during my divorce, I needed help, 
so I lawyered up. If you need help, I urge you to contact Capstrom Law Firm. Capstrom Law Firm in Springfield, Missouri, services clients throughout the state in criminal law, personal injury, and family law. With over 13 years practicing law, Tom Capstrom understands both law and court procedures and how stressful they can be. Let Tom Capstrom Law Firm and his dedicated staff take the stress and worry out of a difficult situation by calling him today. We feel so strongly about the work that Tom and his staff are doing that he'll be a monthly guest on the show. Tom is a veteran and a listener, for God's sake, so you know the guy is solid and will fight for you. Give Tom a call today by calling 417-864-0552 or email Tom at capstromlaw.com. And don't forget to tell him that Vets on sent you. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertising. Would your goal be to get you and your family out of debt? I can show you how thousands of people and families are doing just that. This is a business plan made simple. We offer everything from weight loss products to green cleaning solutions. Whether you're interested in making it a full-time or part-time opportunity to become debt-free, or if you are just sick and tired of being sick and tired, call Jamie at 602-295-9969. That's 602-295-9969. How about that bandit? You got the mirrors on, son. Have you ever wanted to be a truck driver? If so, pay attention. If not, pay attention anyway. Southwest Truck Driver Training offers everything you need to get started. You can get hired before you begin training. They've got GI Bill approved training facilities, day, night, or weekend programs to fit your busy schedule. And if you have any questions, no sweat. They've got veteran supportive campuses with veterans on staff to serve you. And on top of that, they have lifetime job placement assistance. Put the pedal to the metal. Call Southwest Truck Driver Training today. What are you doing Saturday, May 24th, 2014? You should be joining us to help raise money for fallen heroes and wounded veterans. Hey everyone, it's James from Vets On. The American Legion Writers Post 34, in cooperation with its major sponsor, Vets on Media, is honored to present the inaugural Memorial Day Ride 2014. 100% of the nut proceeds raised at this event will go directly to charity, benefiting the Military Assistance Mission, the Army Emergency Relief Fund, and wounded heroes at the Balboa Naval Hospital. This event is veteran-focused from start to finish. The event begins at 0730 at the National Guard Army, located at 52nd Street in McDowell. There will be a breakfast and a chance to connect with over three dozen veteran businesses. A ride through the National Cemetery will also take place to honor the fallen. The ride will end at American Legion Post 34 in Cape Creek, where there will be a full barbecue of hamburgers, brats, baked beans, potato salad, live music, comedians, and numerous raffle items. So join us by registering now at VetsOnMedia.com or on the day of the event. Don't forget to tell a friend and make a difference in the lives of those that have given so much. Again, go to VetsOnMedia.com to pre-register today. You're listening to The Arms Room on the Vets on Media Network. All right, hey guys, we're back. Um, something I forgot to mention in the first section of the show. If you've got questions, comments, or you just want to chat with us about today's topic, um, be sure to give us a call at 602-399-7787 or put a comment in the... Um, Facebook post, our live Facebook post for today, and we'll uh, we'll do our very best to address that for you. Um, right before the break, we were getting into the like really starting to dig into the practicality of of setting up your equipment. Um, it's it's very subjective to you know like I, I'd mentioned John Mosby who has a very different take on things. I have a very different take on things. Matt obviously based on his experience has a different take on things, but start slow spend good money, and seriously think about the things you're buying. Do your research. What? No, that's crazy. Why that would... is a crazy thing. If you want to be outside the box, do your research. Find what other people are doing. You know, I, I was a medic. John's an EOD guy. You know, I'm sure he's talked to, you probably can't even count how many EOD guys about how they set their stuff up. Oh, yeah. Up. And we all, and even even then, we all carry different right. different variations of setups. So. And there, there is no standardized kit. Um that was one of the things that killed me in the Army. You'd see some of these infantry units, and you'd look at, like, 60 dudes standing there, and you're like, 
Why do your vests all look exactly the same? Yeah. Like the left-handed guy with his vest set up like a right-hander. Uh, yeah, just because. Because the company first aren't said so. Yeah. So unless you're in the military and you're required to set your things up, set it up the way that it works for you. And that's that's what it all comes down to is what works for you. Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, someone else might throw my play carrier on and it just doesn't work for them. It's not it's not wrong. It just doesn't work for them. Yep. Um, what works for you for the purposes you need your gear to work for? That's yeah. what it comes down to. You have any thoughts on this, Adam? You don't have any gear? No, nah, you're not a gear guy. You're like, meh, whatever. Yeah. All right. So, um, oh, where was I going to go with that? I had a really good thought there. Do your research. Do your research. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I actually had a really funny experience right after I started working with independent training. I had a very nice uh, chest rig, not dissimilar from this, a little bit, a little bit different, a little bit bigger. And I had that thing set up, dude. I had, it had seven rifle mags in it. It had uh, admin pouch on it. It had four or five pistol magazines. I had a fixed blade knife. I mean, it was, it was set up, right? And I decided to go out and train with it. Um, yeah, I basically, yo, dude, I threw that thing in the trash almost as soon as I got home because I failed to take into account where I carry my pistol. And at the time I carried it the, on my hip, you know, I've now transitioned to a different carry area, but I could not get my pistol out and I really needed to do a transition in one of these drills that we were doing. And I was, you had the pistol on the vest. No, 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 no. It's still in my, you know, in waistband, but my rig was a little too low. And it basically covered my pistol up, and I'm like, crap, slung my rifle, and I'm like fighting to get fighting to get my handgun out. And I'm like, okay, this is wrong. Turns out that wasn't a very practical setup for the things I was going to need. And I found out that all that crap was heavy and not very up. comfortable to wear. So <laughs> You don't really realize how heavy things are until you got mm. loaded mags and water mm-hmm. and all your gear. Then it starts adding up. It really does. That's why I went to a very um, lightweight, slim down, you know, three rifle mags on my plate carrier and a one liter bladder pouch on the back. That's that's it. That's all I need. If I need anything more than that, I'll be able to pick something up laying on the ground. The whole concept of 10 rounds at a dead man's rucksack. So, firm believer in that, by the way, in case you guys didn't notice. Um and camouflage. All right, let's talk about camouflage here, real quick. Colors. Let's talk about color. Um, I'm a matching kind of guy. I, I'm a little OCD you know, about it too. I'm a little OCD about it, but I don't change every time a new camo comes out. Right. Now, would a green triple mag pouch work? It would work exactly. It would the same work as just Cody as well. Brown. Would you ever? No. Put, no. Meaning. Absolutely not. I would not. It, if if my OCD. stuff doesn't match, but I also don't. It's frivolous. It's yeah. silly. Yeah. I don't There's ditch my gear to buy that. cryptic or multicam or um, there's another one. AOR one's hot right now. Oh, Lord. That's what the SEALs are wearing. Yeah. Uh, but nobody makes gear in it except, uh, let's see, London Bridge, I think. London Bridge, Cry, yeah. Patagonia. <clears throat> it's basically the inve- the desert gear. It's desert Marpat. It looks like Marpat just a little more brown in it. Yeah. And then some of like their combat sets, like their actual uniforms a bit different, but you know, unless you're Navy SEAL, do you really need that? No. Probably not. No. No, you um, don't. You can't go wrong with I mean, honestly, whatever color works for your environment. Yeah. Avoid black. Black yeah. is not tactical. No. But I have I have often thought about going to a black setup because I'm not worried about camouflage. If it's going to be me in a civil unrest kind of situation, I'm not all that concerned about camouflage. Exactly. I'm concerned with slaying bodies, and I don't really care what color my vest is. And you will always get black and ACU for very, very cheap. Oh, yeah. If um, Perfect example, those TSSI M9 bags. Um, me having all my gear Coyote Brown, mm-hmm. I held out for a Coyote Brown one and paid... About 80 bucks for it after shipping, which is a really good deal. I pretty much um, hate you for that. I know. Embrace it. Um, the ACU bags, the black bags, um, people couldn't even sell them for like 40, 50 bucks. Yeah, it's horrible. It's the same exact bag. It's the same exact stitching, the same exact material. does the same exact thing, except it's not a cool guy color. 
Um, so if you don't care about color, ACU, black, um, you will you will save a lot of money. The old BDU, woodland BDU stuff. Oh, yeah. Not a lot of tag gear was made in it, but the old OD green, you can still yeah, get a lot of OD. stuff. So if you're looking at experimenting with getting into this type of equipment and stuff, you know, go after some of these off off colors and you can pick it up pretty cheap on yeah. eBay, on gear forums. Surplus store. eBay, eBay's great. Mm-hmm. Um, Craigslist, every now and then yeah. some stuff comes yeah. up. Backpage. Um, Arizona Shooting Guys, a lot of guys sell gear on there. Uh, I just snagged this chest rig for like 15 bucks off there. Nice. Um, what else is in there? There's some you know gear forums. People always sell stuff on AR-15. there. AR15.com has a massive equipment exchange, and you can buy anything yes, on there. Yes, they do. The thing with eBay, make sure if you're going to buy, as it never happened to me. Thankfully, All right. If you're going to buy a London Bridge Trading 6094 Alpha Rig and it's like 20 bucks, buy it uh, now. Mm-hmm. Make sure it doesn't say one sixth in the description because that's for a G.I. Joe. Really? And I've read about people buying them because those things are freaky realistic. So just make sure you read the description. And if you're not, you take you're not your getting photos, a replica, right? You're not getting a rip off. Right. Um, but if you don't care about color um, and you don't really know where you're going to go or how you're going to start it up, nothing wrong with, with the ACU. I'll tell you, a great, um, a great way to get started is the uh, the military issue FLC vests, the fighting load carrier cheap. vest. Yeah, you can pick one of those up and... and I mean, they had them in. Give them away. They had them in three desert or the three colored desert. They had them in the woodland BDU. Now they're obviously ACU. in ACU. Multi cam. Um, did they do them in multi cam? I don't, I don't think they went to the tap, the tactical assault panel, uh, which is based on the tactical Taylor um, modular assault vest right. panel and things like that. Um, some of the companies to look for that make good quality gear at reasonable prices. Or um, the tag, tag makes great stuff. Their prices are, you know, on par with with good quality gear. Um, Tactical Tailor makes phenomenal well, equipment. Stuff. Yeah, and their prices on most of their stuff aren't bad. Some of their stuff they're really proud of. But when you're Tactical Tailor, you can be really proud of some right. of your stuff. Um, Spec Ops has a limited line of vests and things like that, but all other stuff is top notch, and the prices are are fair. Um, Trying to think who else has got good stuff. HSGI. HSGI has good stuff. They're a little pricing yes, they for, are. for the average, you know, weekend warrior. But um HSGI makes phenomenal gear. Um it's I've, not gonna depreciate in value. Though, no, so I've never bought a piece of their gear that I didn't like. Cry, obviously. obviously. You're getting into some money there. London Bridge, you're getting into a lot of money. Um God, there's another big You can company. find the older London Bridge stuff floating around on eBay. Um 2000, you know, 2004, mm-hmm. 2007, um, that people are just getting rid of, and it doesn't really go for what the new stuff goes for. Nice. It'll work for your purposes, and it's quality stuff. Nice. So, what haven't we covered? Jesus, got a lot to cover here. Um, training with your gear, which I think we'll wait and we'll touch on that at the last last portion of the show. Um, when you get your gear, once you get your gear, if you don't know how to set it up, like if you don't know how to put your pouches on there properly, because I've seen this one, this is another one that I've seen a lot, is uh, people don't know how to effectively use their pals webbing to mount pouches. They put it down through there, snap it, buckle it, whatever it is, and then they put their magazines in there and their stuff's like floppy, flopping all over the place. Do yourself a favor, take 15, 20, 30 minutes, Watch a couple of YouTube videos on how to put your stuff on, and you'll find a video for how to use the... How to uh, thread the webbing. Yeah, how to thread the webbing with the malice clips, with the... And most of your stuff nowadays comes with some type of built-in attachment system. Um, the Blackhawk speed clips, which I was never a fan of, because they always seemed... I could never get them to work right. I think the only thing I've used were the malice clips, and then what comes with the pouches. I've never really yeah. ventured outside of that, because it worked for me. Yep, yep. Another thing that worked really well is uh, zip ties. Yes. Zip ties work zip like ties a champ. Zip ties are gold. And then it's easy to... If you uh, need to mount a pouch vertical, sideways, mm-hmm. whatever, don't buy an, you don't need to buy an adapter. Yeah. 
throw some zip ties on there. And duct tape. No, don't use duct tape. No. Don't use duct tape. Although you can fold duct tape up, and it's quite strong to use for random things of that nature. Um, another another thing that drives me crazy on vests is carabiners. But I might need to repel with my vest. Probably not. Probably not. It's a good thing to hang your gloves on until you get your carabiner caught on something. I used to carry a carabiner on my backpack. I actually got it caught trying to pull it out of my truck. Like, almost ripped my arm out of socket so hard. I was like, oh, okay, so there goes my carabiners. But that went back to the, goes back to the practicality of your equipment. Use the stuff. Yeah, don't be afraid to use your stuff. Um, go hiking with it. Yeah. You'll, you'll realize what you need to cut down if you go hiking with your gear. Oh, yeah. I did, I've done that several times with, with different backpacks and different vests and things, and I'm like, wow. Pick up your plate, Carol. Yeah, it's not bad. No, it's, like, halfway through the hike, and you're like, oh, I've made a huge, I've made a huge mistake. I actually see that a lot in training classes. Guys will come out, and, you know, they want to train in their gear, which is a wild and crazy concept for most people that have this stuff. But um, we'll see it. Guys will show up at class, and they'll have, you know, just this ridiculous setup. They'll have like eight rifle magazines two and their pistol pouches. magazines, two dump pouches. Six Why do plates. people use dump pouches? Why are dump pouches so prevalent? You know what I use a dump pouch for? We've picking up brass. This. Yeah. I use a dump pouch to pick up brass. Do I have one on my kit? I have one on my war belt because it's handy to put extra rounds in for training classes. That's all I use it for. You, you have the drawstrings on yours, right? Mm-hmm. I liked it. It's like... Yeah, red wires. Um, red wire gears actually, and we're still testing and developing our super yeah, compact top secret uh, stuff. Top secret stuff. Our super compact uh, dump pouch, which easily fits in your pocket. So, but um, yeah, dump pouches aren't really necessary. You know, I have a specific use for if it. If you plan on fighting your way door to door, you're you know, it's, this is all broad spectrum. If you're a civilian, if you're military. Law enforcement. Law enforcement. Each one's going to have different purposes. You know, if you're out, you know, Yapavai County Sheriff's out in the sticks versus MCSO in Guadalupe, you're going to have much different setups. If you're a recreational shooter, different setup. Mm -hmm. Military depends on what you're doing. We did. We were up in the mountains. I side plates came out. Oh yeah. Um, you really streamlined. Dude, I gear. rode around in my truck and my side plates came out. I was like, nope. It's uh, it gets heavy. Um, they drop us off the mountains for about a week, and mm -hmm. you realize real quick what you use, what you don't use. I had probably three different medical bags. Um, the slim one was basically like a patrol. Um, ideally, you'd carry up in the mountains. You're going with 20 guys. You're the only medic. Then you're yeah. you know, you're gonna bring a big bag. Um, it just depends on what you're doing. Are you using vehicles? Are you not? Are you in a vehicle most of the time? Or is you are you most you know the highest Mostly amount of foot threat patrol. in a vehicle? Is it on foot? Then your your, your whole rig's going to have to come up if you're mainly in a vehicle. You know you might that pistol on your hip might not work that well if you're mainly worried mm. about getting getting compromised while you're in that vehicle. Left or right handed, which right -handed. the majority of people are right handed. So um, it's just tailored to what you you need it for. Um, look at other people that. You know, don't look at some guy who operates up in the mountains if you're, you know, driving around. As Suburban a, Joe. Yeah, armored, uh, you know, driving an armored truck for, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's tailored to fit your needs. That's what it's there. That's why it's modular. <gasps> Crazy concept. Modular, lightweight, load-bearing equipment. Modular, huh? So, um, no, when I was in Afghanistan or any of the deployments I've done is um, I had my vest, and then I ran a split front rig that I could grab and throw on if I had to get out of my truck. By yourself. Yeah. It was all by itself. You know, I kept it sitting right right between the seats in the front of my truck. If I needed it, I could grab it. Try to avoid gear that you can't put on by yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Hey, man, can you, like, hook this up in the back? No, no, can, a little tighter. No, 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 no. Pull that. Uh, oh, God. Okay. Oh, that sucked seen that dance done a few times. Well, the bomb suit's an exception to that. You, There's not really no option. Yeah, you, there, yeah, okay. So I think we're getting ready to go on another break here. Um, we come back, we're going to we'll finish up some of this stuff and talk a little bit more about training and um, finish up the show and move on with our days. So you're listening to The Arms Room. Break up, break up one man. How about that band? 
Did you got some ears on, son? Have you ever wanted to be a truck driver? If so, pay attention. If not, pay attention anyway. Southwest Truck Driver Training offers everything you need to get started. You can get hired before you begin training. They've got GI Bill approved training facilities, day, night, or weekend programs to fit your busy schedule. And if you have any questions, no sweat. They've got veteran supportive campuses with veterans on staff to serve you. And on top of that, they have lifetime job placement assistance. Put the pedal to the metal. Call Southwest Truck Driver Training today. Everyone's going to need an attorney at some point in their life. I'm no different. Hey everyone, it's James from Vets On. Whether it was my last will and testament before deployment or my ongoing custody battle for my children during my divorce, I needed help, so I lawyered up. If you need help, I urge you to contact Capstrom Law Firm. Capstrom Law Firm in Springfield, Missouri services clients throughout the state in criminal law, personal injury, and family law. With over 13 years practicing law, Tom Capstrom understands both law and court procedures and how stressful they can be. Let Tom Capstrom Law Firm and his dedicated staff take the stress and worry out of a difficult situation by calling him today. We feel so strongly about the work that Tom and his staff are doing that he'll be a monthly guest on the show. Tom is a veteran and a listener, for God's sake, so you know the guy is solid and will fight for you. Give Tom a call today by calling 417-864-0552 or email Tom at capstromlaw.com. And don't forget to tell him that Vets On sent you. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertising. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you or someone you know suffering from eczema, diabetes, or vitamin deficiencies? Then I can share with you something to help remedy that with health and wellness. It can be a business plan too, which is a great opportunity to meet and interact with all types of people who care about changing lives. So when you are ready to make a difference, call Jamie at 602-295-9969. That's 602-295-9969. Hey everyone, it's Adam from Vets On. Are you or someone you know looking for employment? Then look no further than iVetX. iVetX is placing veterans with the right hiring companies. Join their mission in putting veterans in inspiring careers with insured success. Access their national pipeline of military talent for companies. All veterans are pre-screened for 55 soft skill set, 800 clarification types, education, experience, salary range, and so much more. iVetX can help you find the perfect job to veteran match. Your skills are based on what's needed for success in that job. If you're a hiring company or a veteran looking for your next career, then get started today and go to www.ivetx.com. iVetX, bridging the employer-veteran gap by putting Americans' veterans to work today. You're listening to The Arms Room on the Vets on Media Network. Hey, guys. We're back. Um, we're going to finish up today with talking about actually training with your gear and some of the common mistakes that people make when they're out training with their gear. Like, for instance, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. It's not fitted properly to them, as I'm sure you've seen on more than one occasion, especially dealing with Joe's. How, you know, here's your vest. Okay. Medics were just as bad. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well. They're still Joes for the most part. Yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, a quote that often comes up is, your gear should fit your training. Your level of training should be, your gear should be appropriate to your level of training, and you should not have to readjust the way you move to use your gear or the way you reload your weapons to use your gear. Like Generally speaking, I run everything on my belt because I'm just an everyday guy. You know, so when I'm out teaching a class, most of the time you'll see me in a t-shirt that says independence training, and then I'll have everything on my belt, and that's how I live my life. Um, now, I do train occasionally with my plate carrier. However, I still run mostly off of my belt, so I'll reload my belt from my plate carrier. So if I have to do a mag, you know, I have to do a reload I'll, off my belt, boom, time and opportunity provides, I take the fresh mag off of my rig, stick it back on my belt because that's where my hand goes. I go to my belt. I don't go to my rig. <coughs> Good grief. I think I'm dying this morning. Sorry. Um, how about you? 
Um, I prefer the vest myself yeah. just because that's how it was ingrained when I was in the, the lovely army. Mm -hmm. um, and then that comes also up with, you know, do you start with the left? You know, work your way from one side to the next. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're going to snag this one and then you're going to snag this one and then you're going to snag that one. Um, you know, it just it's easier to work right to left, left to right, whatever. You know, what works for you. Right. Um, the, another another time and opportunity thing when you're doing that, and when I have run off of my vest, I'll start I'll start with the far left side of my vest because that's closest to my gun, so that's my shortest distance of travel there. And then when I have the opportunity, I'll move everything over to keep that full magazine right there in that first spot because that's where my hand's going to go every time. Um, mm -hmm. And make sure that, and even on my vests, like on my war belt, my pistol mags and my rifle mags are in the same place as they would be if they were on my regular belt that I wear every day. So don't go changing things up too much. And if you do, make sure you train with it and you're able to effectively use it because there's a guy, a uh, big name instructor out there by the name of Pat Rogers, um, and he basically laid it out in the simplest of terms. If you show up looking like an operator and you can run your crap, nobody's going to notice. If you can't, you're going to look like a tool bag. And I've seen that on more than one occasion. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a, we we're doing a carving class. This guy shows up. He's unloading his car. And I look over and you know, he's wearing the cry pants and the, the cry combat shirt. And he comes over and he's got his helmet and his super high speed MSA swordens and, you know, this crazy vest. And it's OAF. Easy. Yeah, OAF, dude. Right. And we get going in class and, you know, Glenn and I before class were like, okay, let's let's see what happens here. You know, dude, turns out the guy was an Air Force JTAC and he actually knew what he was doing. Nobody noticed he was wearing all that crap. But we've also had the opposite end of the spectrum where a guy shows up and his stuff's like flopping off of his kit and he can't do anything. And it's just, it's embarrassing and it's painful. And you learn hard, hard lessons that way, especially when you're out training with your gear. You're not getting your money's worth with the training. No, not you're at fighting all. Your gear. Yeah. You should not fight your gear. <clears throat> um, don't be afraid to to readjust your gear, reevaluate your gear. Um, after you know you get your first little your first little setup going, you're like, okay, this is pretty cool. You know, this is working for me. I'm liking what's going on here. And then you see something new, you learn a new technique, um, a, a new, actually legitimately better piece of equipment comes out, not just in a different camouflage color. <laughs> Drives me crazy. But, um, you know, don't be afraid to readjust your equipment. Don't be afraid to change. It should always be evolving. Yeah, <clears throat> if it's not working for you anymore, move on. Like I've gone through, I can't tell you how many different vest setups because I've figured different things out and different ways to put things on in different areas and... You know, it's constantly, constantly evolving. You know, train with your gear, reevaluate your gear, and readjust your gear. And if you decide you want to upgrade your gear, skip a Starbucks once a month. Save that five or ten bucks, and at the end of the year, you know, you can go out and maybe actually be able to buy one of those London Bridge vests. Um, the other thing with training is um, if you've never worn your stuff and you do wear it, you're going to be tired. And if you can't effectively wear it without it kicking your ass, you should probably take your gear off, put it down, and go find a treadmill or a bike or a hiking trail and start working on some physical fitness. I know that all of our shows end up going back to that at some point. And it's so, so true, and we see it so often in so many classes. The guys are out there, and they're you know, halfway through day one. They're just they're struggling. Their legs are hurting. Their feet are hurting, you know, whatever. A little bit of physical fitness never killed anybody. I promise you that, unless you already had a pre-existing heart condition, and then, you know, I'm sorry. I'm that's sorry. a horrible, sad story. If you want to get your ass kicked, go on a hiking trail that normally kicks your ass Yeah. and wear your plate carrier. Oh, dude. Fully loaded. <sighs> it makes me tired just thinking about it. it makes me horribly it, it tired just thinking about it. It will be humbling and eye-opening once mm. you do that. Um, I don't do that. <laughs> I'm going to start. I need to start doing that. Um, just 
figure out exactly what it's like to wear that thing for two or three or four or five hours or while walking. Days. Wear it around your house when you first get it. Yeah. You know, take some let time. It, let it settle in. Let it, you know. Because new stuff, so it, it, it never fits the same. It's always stiff and uncomfortable when you first put it on. Wear you don't, it for you a don't few like days. how it looks, and then you start questioning it. And then wear it in, break yeah. it in. Standing in front of the mirror doing that. Yeah. This doesn't, why do I look fat in this? Right. Probably because you're fat. I'm like, I look fat in all of my vests because I'm kind of fat, <laughs> but I'm working on it. So, um, <coughs> don't be afraid to use your gear. Is you know, don't be afraid to go out and train with it. If if you break it, well, good. You want to break it when you're training. Training right. is vital to the use of any of this equipment. If you plan to carry a backpack around, because some people aren't all about the vest and the belt and the chest rig and all that stuff, they just carry a backpack. If you carry a backpack when you're out hunting or whatever, load your backpack up with all of your normal stuff, which is technically tactical gear, if that's how you want to look at it, um, and use that. Make sure that your backpack fits. Make sure that you can get to the things you need to get to quickly. On the topic of backpacks and play carriers, if you're gonna hmm. if you're gonna not skimp on certain things when it comes to gear, you can use cheap pouches all day. I don't care. Don't go cheap when it comes to things that support weight, lots mm. of weight. Some things that carry plates, backpacks that are gonna carry sixty pounds of stuff. Make the investment with those. That's a good that's a good solid piece of advice. Don't be afraid to spend money. You're never gonna be sad. Um what else didn't do, 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 do. train with your gear, use your gear, don't be afraid to break your gear. Before you go out and train with it, get it all loaded up and then just go ahead and see how easy it is to lay down prone. Oh, see yeah. if you can still use your gear. Can you still get your mags? Are you are you a foot and a half off the ground because you have <laughs> a triple stack a triple shingle stack on the kangaroo front kangaroo with a Pistol mag on the front, you know. Um, I prefer to keep it really slim. Um, some people do, some people don't. Um, I just, that's what works for me. That's what I prefer. Um, lay down prone with it. Kneel with it. Is it pinching into your, your hip? Is it pinching into your stomach? You know, adjust it accordingly. Um, look up online about how gears are really supposed to fit. Oh, yeah. Um, look at pictures of guys who use this stuff for a living and see how they wear it, where it sits on their body. Because um, where you think it should sit and where it should sit... Most often are two different. different places. Right. You know, um, learn from their experiences. Listen to guys that have actually gone out and used it. There are certain common denominators you will see in pictures of these super high-speed guys. There are certain things you'll see. Every vest, every setup is going to be different with them, but you're, there's going to be certain things you see that are... Like the total lack of admin pouches on top of magazines. And pistol mag knife, pistol mag flashlight. Yes. You're not going to be seeing that. No. Um, fixed blades. Oh, yeah. Um, anything you mount on your vest, and this goes specifically to training with your vest, anything you mount on your vest, make sure you can get to it, whether it's your fixed blade knife, which people seem to be obsessed with, or your med kit. I've seen med kits mounted in like weird, crazy places on vests. That's like, my thing. Up here. Don't put your IFAC on your back. Um, you know, not putting, gonna work. Putting gear on your back. Um, hydration pouch, radio. Mm -hmm. You know, VS seventeen panel stuff. That if you need to get it, it's not going to be right now. You know, immediate. Um, unless you're fighting off each other's backs, door to door, high speed stuff. Mm -hmm. um, don't throw mags on your back. It's just. You're not going to need it. It's just going to be extra weight. Find somewhere up front, put it on a belt. Get you know, get double, put it in your pocket. Get double stacks. Um, just keep it as is the lighter the better. The longer it'll last, the easier it'll be to move. Whether that's speed, distance, sprinting, rolling. Oh yeah, do all of those things in your kit. That's another thing that that um, Mountain Gorilla talks about. His his thing is the going prone thing and and. You know, some people can do it with a full, solid front front rig. I can't do it. I find it ridiculous and uncomfortable, so oftentimes I'll wear a split front rig if I'm doing that kind of thing. But for my civilian setup, I, I don't ever intend to really go prone because, one, I'm going to be in an urban environment. Two, I'm going to be moving a lot. So I don't intend to lay down in the middle of a gunfight unless I absolutely have to. And then it'll just suck for a minute while I'm there right. long enough to do what I need to take care of. 
But don't be afraid to go out and take a class in your gear. That's another thing is people are very self-conscious about being out there in their equipment. You know, they're like, oh, well, I brought this, but I don't really want to wear it because nobody else is. Screw it, dude. It's not about them. It's not about them. It's about you and your equipment and you finding out what works for you, how effective your equipment's going to be for you, and how well it fits you. And even like that handgun class we were at this weekend. Mm -hmm. If I wore this, it'd, it'd give me a good insight as to does this work, does this not work for me? There's no pistol mags on this thing, but you're still wearing it. You're still going to be moving. You're still going to be shooting, reloading. How does, you know, are those yep. pouches getting in the way? Or is, is it too big? Is it too small? Um, training's training. Um, if you're going to... Uh, Can you effectively use your handgun with your, with your plate carrier on? Because I know, like, the military-style vest, it's very difficult. You have to modify your grip because... They spread that armor out so far right. for maximum coverage. Um, that's a really good point. That's a really good point, yeah. Regardless of if it's for your rifle, for your handgun, don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to beat it up because you want to break it in training. We actually found out, and this goes for all of your equipment, we actually found a uh, flaw in a handgun this weekend. Um I won't mention the name of the company, but they went from screwed-on sights to pressed-on sights and doing um, support hand, support hand, single hand stuff. The dude kept raking the front sight out of his pistol. It was the second day? Yeah, this is day two of the class. Um, so you want to break your stuff in training. You want to break yourself in training, you know, not break yourself, break yourself, but that's where you want to find your flaws and your weaknesses is on the training range, you know, you don't want to find out that your magazine pouches are impossible to get magazines out of when you have to have it right now right. because someone's trying you to kill you. You don't want your gear breaking when there's a riot outside your house at 3 in the morning. No. And that's when you realize, oh, hey, this play career doesn't oh, work. Oh, man, this really doesn't fit right. This doesn't. Oh, this sucks. So, we miss anything? Slings. Sling. Oh, oh, good lord. Here's my thing about Buy slings. the Redwire Gear convertible sling available from redwiregear.com. Nice. Um, Shameless A lot plug. of people knock on one points because they're like, oh, if you have to drag a guy, it's going to be hitting in between your legs. How often are you dragging people? Uh, I drug a dude once, once, but I wasn't carrying a rifle. Once. Once. Um, <laughs> that's a thing. A lot of people are going to, you'll read reviews about gear and these people who don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um Oh well, a, a one-point sling is going to hit you in the crotch when you're. It's going to be bumping your knees and you're dragging a guy. Like if you're dragging a guy and you're in a plate carrier and you're you have an M4 slung on your body, a, a barrel tapping your knees is not a concern, not no. a priority. You that probably a, got way worse stuff going on than a barrel bumping your knees. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm actually glad you brought that up. I totally forgot about rifle slings. Wow. Um. Yeah, there's a plethora of, of different, and it, they're, it, rifle slings are like anything else out there. You know, what works for me is going to work for nobody else. Right. You know. Um, I like one point. What really? Is, yeah. You're a big single. I was a big single point fan, and then I started teaching, um, and I don't normally wear a plate carrier and stuff when I'm teaching, so I went to a two point because it's a little bit more comfortable wearing a rifle for right. eight hours and it mostly staying slung on your no, body. Nothing wrong with having a couple different slings for what your purposes are. Just buy yeah. one from me because it's, have it's to. convertible. Have to. It's convertible. So you know, I like a one point with a play carrier, like two point or you know your normal type of sling with you know a smaller rig if I was going right. hiking, you know backpack hunting trip something like that. You know you don't right. want a one point on you the whole time. But no. it fits fits what it needs to fit what you're doing. Yes, and that's what all comes back down to. Yep, practicality. A lot of people are going to talk about oh this play carrier is a drag handle like. You really okay. need to, like that's cool. I don't know that like, they are there plate carriers without drag handles anymore. I'm sure there are. Probably. But. So all right. Um we're being told that we have to start wrapping this up now <laughs> because we could go on for this for hours. So let's recap here. What are we talking about? We're talking about your tactical gear. Um take your time, set it up, do your research, invest. make sure it invest good money into it. Um don't be afraid to change it. Don't be afraid to train with it. Um, you have anything to add, Adam, before we take off? Be safe. Be safe. <laughs> that's, that's good, solid advice for a Monday morning. So, um, closing thoughts, Mr. Dobson? 
if you have to only invest in a certain couple things, do it on the load bearing stuff, the heavy, the stuff that's going to carry the weight, your plate carrier, your backpack. Nothing wrong with saving some bucks. Condor, double stitched Cordura. All right. You know, nothing wrong with that. It's good. Solid do your advice. research. Train with it. Yep. Roll around with it. Go prone with it. Don't then, be scared. Then humble, humble yourself and see how it does or doesn't work. All right. Well, my my closing thoughts on this are ah, good times. Um, don't be afraid to use your gear. If you've got any questions, give us a call. Post up on our Facebook page. You guys have fun this week. Real training sucks. Embrace the suck. This is the Arm Room. We'll see you guys next week.